So today we're going to be talking about forecasting using machine learning. And my name is Matt Connors. I'm a principal program manager in the Cloud AI group. And I'm here with Thomas Singliar, who's a senior data scientist in the organization. And let, we're going to talk about an announcement we made today, which is the Azure Machine Learning Package for Forecasting. Let me spend just a couple minutes about why we're focused on forecasting, where the learnings from this package took place, and then Thomas is going to take us through a couple of demonstrations. So let's talk about why forecasting matters. And the real reason is that being wrong can be expensive. And there was a study by KPMG that said, on average, companies miss their forecast by 13%, and that impacts shareholder value by 6% on average. So if you think about it, a lot of real important business decisions oh. re having a good forecast to know how much supplies to purchase, to know how much inventory to have on stock, to set expectations with Wall Street. And I just did a quick little search this week on the term negative earnings surprise. Do people know what that means? That means earnings came in less than what was expected. And here's just one example of many negative earnings surprises that happened just last week. And here's a stock that went down 10% when you miss your earnings. So it can be expensive when you get it wrong. Um, the, number, the other issue is that in finance, the whole budgeting and forecasting process is cited by CFOs as one of the major concerns. It's very time consuming, it's very labor intensive, and there's a lot of human bias that goes into the, into the forecasts. And what, in fact, what we did for the last three and a half years is a team of four data scientists and myself who, who actually came from finance, we've been working with our finance organization and we've built a machine learning forecast solution for our finance organization. And here's a quote from Amy Hood, our executive vice president, and she said that it's really an integral part of our budgeting and planning exercise now. Now, the technology that the team developed for this forecasting across Microsoft was a forecasting framework that was used for a wide variety of businesses, from our consumer business to our enterprise business, different products, software, hardware, different revenues and different financial metrics. So we looked at revenue, sales, and costs. And what the team has developed now is, and there's a couple of case studies here we can point you to to get some more information about the project where we're using machine learning forecasting and finance. Um, but what we're announcing is the Azure Machine Learning Package for Forecasting. And it's a, it's a Python API, and it's really been designed for a couple of use cases, namely financial and demand forecasting. And it's, a, it's an API that takes, enables the entire forecasting workflow. Okay, so it starts from bringing in a time series data set, converting it into a time series format so we can do interesting forecasting work on it, there are some exploratory reports that you can get with just one line of code. Um, the forecasting framework takes your data set and automatically creates features. So it does the featureization for you. Um, it does modeling, uh, fitting models, uh, time series cross-validation. Um, it then selects the most accurate model from a number of different models that it tries based on the best historical back-tested performance. And then with integration into Azure, these models can be deployed as web services. So that's a little bit of introduction. Why don't we let Thomas go through the details and see this in action. Hello, folks. Um, how many of you are, how many of you know about Azure Machine Learning? OK, how many of you actually use Azure Machine Learning? Very good, thank you. Well, I'm going to give more of you a uh, reason to. Um, uh, let me switch to my slide here. And what I'm going to do is walk you through the notebook that you have available uh, on the documentation page. I'm going to need a little bit of AV help here because I'm not showing the, um, sorry. Not showing the page. So this notebook uh, is available from the docs, and uh, you can go through it and, and follow along. <coughs> and uh, I, it's, a, it's a long notebook, so I'm just going to be uh, showing some highlights to you. Not, not oh, I'm pr presenting from here. I didn't, I didn't want that one. <laughs> I wanted this window, please. Is that the window I have? 
I, I, I have to drag it over. Okay, I'll drag it over. All right, with that little AV uh, hiccup uh, gone, I'm going to figure out if I can make this a little bit larger for you. Um, very good. So you have this notebook, and uh, you can get it. Um, there's a lot of imports, but that's because we have a lot to show you. Um, and the first thing that happens is what always happens when you're starting a data science project, and that's where that's you, uh, that you load data. Here, we are loading a data set of sales of orange juice in the Dominic's grocery chain. This is an ancient data set, uh, but it's perfect for demonstrating our, the sales forecasting features of this. So basically, what you have is a number of stores, about 80 of them. And in each store, we have sales of uh, three brands of orange juice, Tropicana, Minute Maid, and so on. Um, the weeks are represented by numbers, and there's a logarithm of the amount sold. And that's weird, but that's how econometricians uh, work. So what we're going to do is we're going to do some standard transforms in pandas, just like you're used to, and uh, replace that with the actual quantity and replace that with the actual uh, days. So what you get back is this. So far, pure pandas. Uh, what you get back is about 250 time series. And right now, this is the crucial thing that happens. We are going to declare some metadata on the data frame so that from now on, uh, the package knows what roles each column in that data frame is playing. So uh, we know we want one time series per store and brand. Um, this is the time axis, and this is the quantity, named quantity, that we want to predict. Uh, we're also telling it that we want one uh, forecasting model per store. So what you get back still looks like a time series uh, data frame, and that's fine. And you can do all of the things that you are normally used to doing to data frames, because this is just a subclass of uh, Pandas data frames uh, that we made uh, compatible with time series. So you can do all of the things that you're used to doing. There's no learning curve. And you can simply treat it as a Pandas data frame. But, and it will do the right things that are, uh, that are the sensible thing to do for time series. So the first cool feature I want to show you is a, what we call a time series report. If you run this one-liner on the Pandas data frame, you get back all sorts of information about the time series. Um, you get sort of the standard things about time series, but you also get things like frequencies that are inferred. So right here, uh, what we're looking at is, oh, we believe that most of these, there's no seasonality beyond one period in, in, this, in this time series. And you can uh, see all this in picture. This is the average behavior of the time series. This is the decomposition of the time series in trend and noise and all of the and seasonality. So these are all of the things you would do in an um, exploratory data analysis of a time series data frame, all in one line. And scroll, scroll, scroll. OK. So the next thing you might do is try to examine a hypothesis. For instance, hmm, I wonder if weather has any kind of uh, influence on the sales of orange juice. Okay, So we made a little convenient uh, function for you. Um, it, it allows you to get some weather data from NOAA. This is a public data source. Um, and you basically just pull it in, and you merge it. Right? Again, all of the functions that you are used to uh, using from pandas just work. Okay? So what you have here is then uh, your uh, data frame with all of the things in it that you are used to, uh, all of the uh, demographic variables about the store, and at the end you have some, um, some weather variables. Okay? So the next thing that happens in data science is usually you need to do some data cleaning. Specifically in this case, uh, we're looking at a time series uh, that has some gaps. Pretty much every time series you're going to encounter in business is going to have some gaps. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to pull out a simple class from the toolkit um, that just um, does various kinds of imputations. Uh, it's called time series imputer. And it will fill up your data with some sort of a reasonable thing. Again. With one line, you get something that normally takes 
you know, 10 lines of scikit code. Y you, can you do it with scikit? Can you do it with plain pandas? Yes, it's going to cost you 10 times as many lines, right? Um, so now we're getting into real time series here. Um, when I say univariate time series models, this is the bread and butter stuff of time series forecasting. This is your naive model. This is your ETS. By the way, this is the first implementation of ETS in Python that I've ever seen. Um, there isn't one. Now there is. Um, and you, know, you can try your standard ARIMAS. And what we're going to do is we're going to stick it into a forecaster union, which is a sort of a little convenience class that allows you to do the same thing to a number of forecasters. So we're going to stick it in there, and we're going to run fit on it. So we're going to train with the training data, all of the forecasters at the same time. We're going to run predict on it. Now what you're seeing is fit and predict, right? So if you speak scikit-learn, um, that's very familiar, right? This is, again, uh, something that you don't have to relearn again. Uh, you know, fit and predict is standard scikit stuff. Again, we are making all of our transforms and all of our estimators um, compatible with scikit pipelines. So it's interoperable with scikit, and um, you don't have to learn a whole lot, right? Because we already have that. OK, so now we, we ran these five forecasters. We need to know how well we did, uh, which one is the best, right? Um, we could use a lot of the pre-built functions that we have in the forecasting uh, package. Uh, that uh, basically we have the standard MAPES and symmetric MAPES and things like that. But if we wanted to do something fancy and perhaps declare we want to do the median performance, which makes sense, um, you can, of course, use your own function as well. Um, so OK, we're going to compare these. And we're going to see that mm, the naive forecaster, uh, this, you know, those of you who have done forecasting, you know that the naive forecaster is surprisingly hard to beat. And the naive forecaster just does, OK, whatever the value of the time series was yesterday, it is today. Um, hard to beat. Um, but of course, we, we are not here to, to use the standard methods that have been around for 30 years. Um, instead, we want to take advantage of the progress that has been made in the machine learning community with great models. Right? So what we're going to do, we're going to do some standard featureization. Um, Specifically, we're going to um, impute some uh, missing values. We're going to drop the column that would give us a target leak. We're going to um, featureize the time index. This will give you features of the sort of like day of the week and you know week of the month. Um, and we're going to do we're going to featureize the grain, right? The grain, if you remember, were the combination of store and uh, brand. So if you featureize that uh, to individual one-hot encoded features, this is, this is going to give you sort of a nice uh, mixed effect model. Um, so as you, know from, uh, as you know from your scikit days, uh, because you're not going to need scikit anymore uh, once you have this, um, you can put all of these transforms and all of these uh, pipelines, in, uh, all of these uh, estimators in a pipeline. And what we're going to do is uh, do the fit transform on the training, training data set, right? So we're going to train those, data, uh, train those um, estimators and transforms. And then we're going to just do the transform, not yet the predict on the testing set. So that will create the featureized data set for the prediction. And we can look at it, and it's fine. Um, and again, we're going to do the forecast union trick here. We're going to take five machine learning models and use our regression forecaster class here to convert the forecasting problem into a regression problem. And you can use any, any, regression, any regression estimator that you have in Scikit or in your other favorite libraries, whatever. So we're going to put them in a little forecaster union and run the fit. Um, and this time, we're running the predict. And we were running our evaluation part. And voila, what we're getting is actually the random forest uh, has gotten us a significant improvement over the, naive, over the naive forecaster, which is a feat. It's hard to do. Um, so there is some value in converting forecasting problems into regression problems so that you can run your complicated uh, fancy models on it. 
So the next thing we want to do, we actually want to do some serious evaluation. Um, standard methods for uh, doing evaluation when you have a short um, uh, time series, a small amount of data, is to make use of all the data you have and you do so something like cross-validation. The problem with cross-validation in time series is that um, it is really hard not to shoot yourself in the foot. Right? You think, you know, I'm going to just use the data up to here as training and our data up to there as, as testing. And, but once you start using rolling window features and leads and lags, you're going to create a target leak. You're going to peek into the future and you're going to have all sorts of problems, right? So we, made, we created a class which, if you know Scikit, is similar to the Scikit classes uh, that basically will not let you do that. It will not let you shoot yourself in the foot. It will do uh, the splitting and the evaluation in the proper way, respecting the time series structure. So uh, having done that, uh, we're going to also um, borrow a concept from Scikit called grid search, and this will allow you to search for the best parameterization for the model that you've selected. And uh, if you know grid search, we have now TS grid search, right? And it will give you a best uh, parameterization. So what we're going to do is we're going to add our best model to the pipeline, and we're going to run it, uh, fit and predict. And now you have a trained pipeline that begins with the data and ends with predictions that come from your best model that you've selected on the basis of rigorous cross-validation. So now what you need to do is put that in production. Uh, and that's what operationalization means, if I can pronounce that. Um, operationalization basically means with Azure Machine Learning, you are creating web services. Uh, the web services input is your historical data. The web services output is your forecast. You need to set up a whole bunch of these um, things because we're in the cloud, so there, you know, any application in the cloud, even the smallest one, has at least five different kinds of resources. Um, but we have a little convenience function here uh, that will help you navigate uh, this setup. You know, you have to create your uh, environment, and you have to create your cluster, and you have to deploy this and deploy that. So we have that little convenience setup function. So once you've done all of that. Um, you just say, hey, these are my settings for Azure Machine Learning. Here's my pipeline. So I'm going to instantiate myself a little web service factory, so the thing that makes web services. And I'm going to say, deploy. And part of the reason why I'm not doing this out of a live notebook, but one that I ran a, uh, a little bit ahead, is that this, um, this deployment takes about five minutes, and I don't have five minutes. Uh, so it will, do, it will do a couple of things for you, but at the end, at the very end, it will, you will end up with a URL and a way to get the, the scoring key, right? So you now have a web service that's deployed into Azure, it's deployed as a, uh, that you can, you can just call. And in fact, uh, we have some uh, convenience classes for calling this uh, web service here, and the reason why we have that is this because we have deployed the web service into a scalable Azure Container Service cluster, um, then uh, we can allocate as many Docker containers uh, to this service as is necessary, so we can set the scaling parameters on the ACS cluster as needed, and um, it will allow us to score many time series in parallel. So if you just call score, you get the results back. And the results we got back you know, uh, are sort of in the, in the reasonable format. So the forecast for the, eighth, the week ending the 8th of January uh, made with data um, up to the 1st of January for Dominic's is 17,000 units. Right? And that's basically, that's basically what it does for you. So uh, TLDR, this is a library that lets you do, use your established pandas um, primitives, or uh, your, your sort of st standard idioms. Um, it is easy to use if you've learned Scikit before, and it will let you create uh, forecasting web services in the cloud. And if I can bother you for one more minute, I have, um, I have this thing for you. Uh, this is a little preview from our dev branch. 
this notebook will also be available. And it, it shows that suppose you have a established workflow for uh, forecasting. Suppose that's an LSTM, a long, short-term memory uh, model. What you can do is, so probably you're doing something like this, you know, right now, you know, these uh, various data munging steps. Um, you shouldn't be doing that. You should be using the, the workbench. It's, it's much simpler. And, um, but at the end, what you do is when you are done with creating your model, which was up here, um, it's basically the, the simplest possible implementation of LSTM in Keras. At the bottom, all you do is Azure ML Forecast Pipeline, LSTM model, deploy, done. And you're scoring, right? So here you are scoring, here you are evaluating. The, the numbers we got out of this, out of the LSTM, are basically on this data set, which is the prediction of Dow Jones revenue, competitive with uh, the state of the art and all of the other models that we have tried. So um, LSTMs actually work for time series. And if you have an ex existing workflow that involves uh, perhaps LSTMs, you may not use the entire machinery that we set up for you, but you can still use it to deploy your workflow to Azure as a web service. And thank you very much.